Uh, I will mention privacy notices and maybe just allude to the importance thereof. Uh, point number six, we will be talking about a culture change and uh, I'm not referring to culture change in the broad sense of a word, but, but simply the, the culture of how we deal and treat private information. And uh, we will then reach our conclusion by talking also about the road forward. And I would like to also um, maybe just pose a, a challenge to, to everybody that's attending uh, this morning. So uh, we, we want to achieve papaya compliancy. We can, and I have already done this. Those of you who, who, who checked your e-communications, you would have probably saw the pictographs that were posted. Um, uh, there's also privacy notices that uh, are posted on our website. So uh, is that enough? That's the question. And, and the simple answer is no. We, we are not going to reach papaya compliancy by simply doing those things. It is achieved, and I totally agree with this, at one conversation at a time. Hence, I'm saying the whole idea, the objective of today and of all the other webinars that are to follow will be to spark that conversation, to, to get us all as colleagues to start talking about the papaya. So a little bit of background. So this act, you will see that it formally came into effect on the 1st of July, 2021. But yet, if you look at the description, the formal description of this act, you'll see that it was already promulgated in 2013 and certain parts of it already came into effect at that time. However, the most important sections only came into effect on the 1st of July this year. And those are the sections that are really uh, important to us at, at VUT. You might be sitting there asking yourself a question, but really, does this have anything to do with me? Uh, I am working in this particular department and I don't really work with anybody's personal information. It's not just that, uh, ladies and gentlemen. It, it has implications for everybody, for all of us who not only collect, but who might be in a position to, to process uh, information. And, and here's the other thing, where you share personal information, you are in the loop, you are, you are in the papaya uh, um, loop, so to speak, where we store personal information. So there, if there's departments here represented today, let's say from the IT department or from uh, the, the, the registrar's office, uh, where information are stored, whether electronically or perhaps in, in, in a hard copy format, Papaya has specific uh, requirements pertaining to that. And what do we do with information when it reached the end of its life, of, of its purpose for which it was, it was collected? How do we destroy that? And likewise, that's also um, dealt with by the, the papaya. Uh, I, I just want to go back to slide number four quickly. Um, where we talked about the papaya compliancy. Uh, people often ask me, do we have a poppy policy? Or give me a copy of VUT's poppy policy. And the short answer, uh, colleagues, is that you won't find a poppy policy anyway. We are working on a policy framework, uh, which will consist eventually of a number of policies. So let me give you an idea. Uh, a policy on uh, privacy, a policy on personal information, perhaps, a policy on uh, cybersecurity. At the end of the day, all of these policies together will form a policy framework against which our actions, how we deal with information, um, will be measured. So we need to make sure that the policy framework that will be implemented at VUT would then cover all the various aspects 
uh, also covered for in the act. Now this act, this uh, PIA, or the Protection of Personal Information Act, if you look at it, you'll see that it consists of 12 chapters. Uh, chapter one deals with definitions and purpose. Chapter two with who does it apply to? Where? Who must uh, implement this? Chapter three deals with the conditions for lawful processing of personal information. Now, uh, colleagues, if, if at this stage you say to yourself, you know, it's just too much. I, I don't want, I don't want to go through all of this. You know, there's 12 chapters and it talks about exemptions and supervision and it talks about prior authorization, whatever that might be and codes of conduct and, and what on earth is a trans-border information flow? Uh, no, it's got nothing to do with me. I don't want it. There's enforcement, offenses, penalties and the general provisions. Now, if you're saying all of that, I want to invite you today and say, right, okay, take baby steps. Look only then in the beginning at the first three chapters, because for all of us, doesn't matter which department we represent here today, you will have to know the lingo. You will have to know the definitions. You will have to know how does this POPIA apply to your particular job. And, and when I say that, I want to also just mention that, remember, the POPIA does not only affect you in your workplace and with your with the carrying out of your of your duties. It also affects you in a, in a in a on a much more personal level, where your own information needs to be protected. You yourself and and myself included, we share our information with a number of uh, institutions and and people. We we on social media. We um, we we complete. Uh, uh, registration forms. Uh, we are registered to vote one of these days. We go and see the doctor or an attorney and we complete personal information uh, application forms. So on, on, on that level, also be cautious and, and, and try and understand how that would impact on your personal life and, and of that of your family and, and your, your friends even. You know? So all right, so if you really have to narrow it down, if all of this is just overwhelming, I want to invite you to look at least at the first three chapters. Have a good read, um, especially chapter three, which uh, deals then with the conditions for lawful processing of personal information. Now, chapter number three, or chapter three, deals with basically three aspects. Um, there's a general aspect, then there's an aspect dealing with processing of special personal information. And also, uh, thirdly, there's an aspect that deals with a processing of personal information relating to children. So uh, generally speaking, the first section, if you take the time to read that, you will find that it deals with the conditions of um, processing uh, data or personal information. And, and those conditions are extremely important. Uh, you have to comply with each and every condition whenever you go around and you um, process or collect or store uh, or even destroy information belonging to somebody else, personal information. Now, those conditions include the condition of minimality for, for argument's sake. Minimality meaning you're only supposed to collect the minimum uh, amount of information needed for your particular purpose. So depending on the reason why you're collecting this information, you will you will probably not ask too many questions. Uh, is it really necessary to know the gender? Uh, is it necessary to know the sexual orientation of a person uh, for the purposes that you're collecting it? And that's a question that will have to be asked each and every time 
that we deal with the personal information of, uh, of data subjects. Um, so, so that's the processing limitation. What, what is the purpose? The purpose specification that would guide you in determining what uh, uh, type of information you would probably need. Um, and here's an interesting one. One of the conditions is there's a, there's a, there's a, a restriction on the further processing of information. So you collected this information in the first instance for a particular purpose, and then realized that you can also use it for a different purpose. Now, if it's not related to the, uh, the, the initial purpose for which it was collected, uh, we might have a challenge. So that condition needs to be carefully looked at as, as well. The information quality is another condition. When we deal with information, we need to make sure that that information is, is accurate and that it is updated from time to time. We must give the data subject an opportunity to update and to check his or her information. And that's where the condition of openness also comes in. The information might be collected by the responsible person. Uh, we'll, we'll see who that is in a moment. Uh, but the responsibility also extends towards showing the data subject the necessary courtesy to say, although I've collected this information, it really is your information. It belongs to you. It has certain um, importance to you as, as, a, as a person. Uh, I, I just looked at the statistics this morning of identity fraud. You know that identity fraud has gone up by 347% uh, compared to 2020 figures. It is massive, it is staggering. And yet it's only a small portion of the importance of a Protection of Personal Information Act. I'm just mentioning that to show uh, the audience that we, um, uh, we must be very careful when we deal with the information belonging to somebody else. We, we don't want to be the cause of information that's leaked and uh, which causes eventually uh, financial or other damage to a, a data subject. So speaking of the conditions, uh, please go through them, go and have another look. Uh, there's also the security safeguards, which is a big one. When we collect, and, and this is the bottom line, uh, colleagues, when we collect that information, we take the responsibility uh, as employees of a responsible person, the UT, to safeguard that information. And yes, we might say um, that falls within the scope of, of the IT, IT department. And to a certain extent, you would be right. But have a look also, evaluate your own circumstances in your office where you operate on a daily basis. At home, um, the, the, the fact that many of us are working from home also has a significant impact on the protection of personal information. When we access personal information of data subjects, uh, say in our offices at home or uh, in our office on campus, we are responsible for that information and we must make sure that it's not uh, being uh, made, uh, it, it, does, it does not become available to a person who does not have uh, the right to access to that information. I remember in my teaching time, uh, probably about 20 years ago, we worked with, with learners' personal information. Uh, we, we called it the learner portfolio. And you literally would have all the information that's available on that child, you would have in one file. And I remember one of my colleagues uh, leaving the learner portfolios of his class uh, on his desk and went out for break. When he came back, he found that one of the students accessed that information and looked at his own information to find out that he was actually adopted. Now, can you imagine what 
impact that had and, and, and what shockwaves, and I'm talking uh, in the 1996 year, uh, even before Popia, it, it created a massive problem because that information was supposed to have been protected. That teacher was in charge of storing that information. He had full access and there was no way that he could um, just simply uh, argue that uh, I went out for break, uh, I forgot to close or to lock my classroom door. And, and just on that point, um, we must also as employees of VUT understand that we deal with personal information also of the, um, the university, of our service providers, of our students, of the visitors visiting our campus, council, etc. However, if we are the custodians of that information and it's stored, let's say, on our laptop or on a hard drive or on a, um, on a stick, that responsibility of protecting that information is squarely on the shoulders of that particular employee. So just in the, the passing by, I'm not going to go through the rest. You've already read that. So... Um, the conditions, that's in section A of chapter three, processing of special personal information. Allow me only to say the following about special in personal information. Uh, interestingly enough, that's information pertaining to a person's gender, uh, sex, sexual orientation, criminal record, um, et cetera. So how many times have we had access to uh, say personal information pertaining to a an employee relating to his or her sexual orientation or, or uh, uh, gender or perhaps even a criminal record or um, strangely enough uh, you also information pertaining to a person's uh, political views. Uh, so we must be we must become really aware of the possible pitfalls before we start sharing information and uh, dare I say, <laughs> gossip about somebody. That, that can, get, can get you into more trouble than what you anticipated. So um, the third one there, children. Now we are in a position, fortunately in a position at VUT where we normally would not have to deal with personal information of children, but be cautious. We might end up with a student that has not reached the age of 18 yet, in the exceptional case. And, um, uh, or you are a researcher conducting research with um, uh, individuals with, with children. Uh, make sure that you understand then what requirements there are when uh, collecting and, and processing the information of minors. So what, what is Popia then really all about? And okay, I've said a lot, uh, but, but really does it have anything to do with, with VUT? I mean, we're just a university that um, uh, deals with our 20,000 odd students and our, uh, our service providers and our staff. And, and we in the game of uh, higher education and training and, and really, what, what does it have to do with us? Now, now to answer that question is, 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 is relatively easy and some of you probably also worked it out already. The question that we need to answer is whether the institution process personal information. Yeah, we do. We not only process, we collect the information, we process it. Um, uh, we register our students, we update their marks on ITS, uh, we um, send those marks then off to, uh, to the exams office, um, and there they also process the information further until the stage where the student hopefully graduates, and, and then that information is then uh, also uh, used in, in a different fashion to determine who graduates, etc., cetera, etc. Cetera. So, do we enter the information in, into a record that forms part of the filing system? Yeah, we do. Um, 
Are we domiciled in South Africa as an institution? Yes, we are. Are we making use of automated or non-automated means to process the personal information in South Africa? Most certainly we do. So there's only one conclusion when to reach that VUT, just like all the other public universities in South Africa, um, will have to comply with the conditions and requirements of Popia. We deal with data subjects. And, and I don't know if, if all of us really understand and comprehend the enormity of uh, or the wide scope of data subjects that we deal with. I mean, it's prospective students, uh, student applications uh, or applicants. That person is not even a student or enrolled student yet, but has applied. How do we access, how do we uh, deal with that information? How do we store it? How do we make sure that that information is kept safe? that uh, against possible hacking for argument's sake or destruction in a fire or uh, water or whatever. Um, we, we're not only dealing with our local students, we deal also with exchange students, with postdoctoral fellows, uh, alumni, uh, staff. I mean, just the number of staff it, that VUT has. Can you ima imagine the number of applications that VUT would receive for particular posts that were advertised. Um, does that also fall under the umbrella of personal information? No, most probably. When we look at the definition later on, you will agree with me that it actually does. Uh, members of uh, committees, external members of committees. Well, what about our... Uh, council members, researchers. Now, I, I know that, that, that some of the VUT researchers have, have contacted my office to find out, you know, how is this going to impact on, on the research, uh, the specifically the ethics evaluations uh, and applications that they receive? Uh, I, I, read, um, uh, I read a report that was uh, where a personal impact or personal information impact assessment had been concluded by one of uh, the South African universities. And they found that of all the departments in that university, the research departments and, and people that were actively involved in research with your ethical committees, your ethics committees, your, your frick committees and all that, that those people tend to be more popular compliant than the, the average employee of that university or even student. And the reason for that was, and still is, because of uh, the high standard of ethics that are required in terms of, of research. So uh, my message to the researchers today, don't worry too much. I will assist and I will also uh, host a webinar. I'm planning a, 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 to host a webinar where we can look at specific research related um, activities and, and questions. And you are welcome and I will extend the invitation later on again. You are welcome to, to, to let me have that um, uh, those questions. So service providers, independent contractors, members of the public, visitors, Every day, those of you that are working from campus, uh, people that visit the campus, everyone, each and everyone has to provide some measure of personal information to the security guards before you um, are allowed to enter. Uh, again, a quick question or a thought. So is that personal information? Yeah, you are required to, to, to give your name, your surname, uh, your cell phone number, is that personal? Yes, it is. And uh, where you work, your occupation. Um, so, yes. And, and now, does it apply? Does PAPIA then apply? Those conditions that I spoke about earlier on 
that are contained in chapter three, do they apply also to the security guard who's collecting personal information of employees and guests? Yes, it does. Short answer. Donors, funders, everybody, council members. Uh, I'm going to pause here briefly, uh, Naledi. If, um, if there are any questions, then I will gladly take them now and take a sip of water first. Now, lady, I think you're on mute. Sorry for that. I, I was saying that at the moment, there aren't any questions. However, Prof Dix did post a comment saying it will be great to hear more about research, especially when considering demographic information in questionnaires and interviews that will be done. Yeah, uh, demographic information, Prof Dix, you are absolutely right, uh, will fall squarely within the definition of personal information. Um, uh, as I indicated earlier on, I, I, would, I would love to, um, to engage with, with our researchers and our different uh, FRIC committees um, and, and, and just to identify the real uh, issues that you might have or the questions that you might have. So you are very welcome to, to email me with those as well, and I can then work it into a follow-up presentation. Uh, thank you for that, Naledi. I'm soldiering on here. Sorry, Sorry. Um, so for she, the questions are now coming in, as you uh, okay. say. <laughs> um, there's a question from Anneke de Klerk, and her question goes as follows. Does a person's image, example, fa facial features, fall under personal information? Short answer, yes. Um, we we will we will look at it now and uh, yes it it will. The following question comes from Fatima Mohammed, and the person's question goes as follows: Yes, please. I want to know more info on how this affects research, as she as I am a chairperson of management science of the F FREC management science. Uh, I, I extend the same invitation, uh, uh, Fatima. You are very welcome to make contact with me, and, and I really would like to, to engage with, uh, with all the FREC uh, committees. And then, Mr. Fushi, one last. I see that um, Prof. Dix's hand is up. Um, can I just allow her to of pose course. a question? Of I'm sorry, um, that, uh, that was an old time, but in any case, I think the objective of what um, personal information like gender would be asking questionnaires uh, can pose a serious problem for uh, researchers because I really need to then think about why you ask a question um, perfectly. Um, uh, not just for the sake of asking demographic information. So that's all that I want to say. Thank you. Yeah. yeah if, I, if I can just uh, comment on that, uh, Prof. Dix, uh, that falls squarely within the, uh, one of the conditions of, uh, of uh, processing of personal information with regards to the minimality uh, and, and um, limiting your your. your information process limiting so I, I think we will all be challenged to really identify the crucial questions when we plan our research activities to really say find out what is it exactly in terms of personal information that we require and 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 there's something else with regards to the researchers and, and i don't want this to just be about research now but, but I think it is important that we just mention it. When we deal with information, personal information, there's sometimes also a possibility to de-identify to de uh, information. Uh, I'm just going to ask, there's some colleagues that's on, who says, 
if not on mute, I think that's fine now. Thank you. So where we can actually uh, de-identify information. In other words, where the person's identity, identity will not be evident from the information that we post. So uh, age is obviously also personal information, but if we, if we publish age and, and even perhaps gender, but there's, there's no real connection or way to find out direct or indirect to uh, who are we referring to here, then it's fine. We can use it in our research paper. We can report on it. We say that a certain number of people of this gender, this race, uh, within the age group of 50 to 59 have displayed the following uh, strengths or weaknesses or uh, resilient uh, uh, or res resilience factors that were uh, yeah, that they employ at work. So there are ways to, to go about to still do your research in a popular correct way in, in, in terms of the legislation. So having said that, um, let's uh, quickly talk about the PR decisions. Uh, and, and, and this relates slightly also to what you mentioned earlier on uh, Professor Dix. Whenever we collect information, when I say we, the UT at large, but also us as colleagues. So do we just, collect the information for the mere sake of collecting, it can never be, it mustn't be. There must be a legal basis for that collection. If we are registering students, there is a legal basis to collect the student information, ID numbers, uh, residential uh, addresses, uh, uh, information pertaining to the parents, uh, uh, probably what? Bank, banking details, we, we can argue about that. Do we need the banking details? Um, whatever your answer would be to on, on that, you will have to consider your, your decision. What or which personal information must be collected? What are we going to use it for? Uh, whose personal information in the first instance do we need? Do we only need personal information from uh, with regards to our students or, we do, or do we also need information regarding the uh, family members? Um, do we give access to the data subjects to their personal information? Um, well, one of the conditions was uh, the one of openness in terms of openness. Uh, we, we probably will have to, to, to make information available upon request. And I'm going to briefly talk about that when I refer to the PAIA manual. I'm not going to tell you what that is for now. I'll see if you can decipher it as, as we go along. And then um, we will talk about openness in that respect. How long do we keep the personal information for? Now, here we have to be careful. Uh, some information needs to be kept uh, by virtue of statute legislation for a certain period of time. Um, in, in my law firm, uh, all uh, information pertaining to a client, client needs to be kept for a minimum period of seven years after completion of the matter. So I am, uh, in terms of legislation, obliged to comply in, in that regard. And the same uh, will have to be ascertained uh, in respect of the information that uh, you yourself uh, will be dealing with. Um, at what stage can we make amendments to the personal information? So these are all decisions that will eventually have to be considered whenever we deal with um, personal information. The jargon, the definitions, uh, sometimes uh, when you hear certain words, uh, you, you just stand amazed and you wonder what on earth does it mean? If, if you hear a uh, reference to, let's say, a responsible person, you, you might be thinking, okay, a responsible person is uh, someone who in his actions or her actions uh, act responsibly. Uh, well, that's perhaps one meaning. Uh, when it comes to the uh, 
when it comes to the popia, your definitions will have most certainly different meanings. So obviously, these are not all the definitions. The definitions are found in, in chapter one of the popia, um, which is part of that compulsory section that I mentioned earlier on that uh, all of you uh, would must please have a look at. So, um, so who, who are the data subjects? Um, that's us as employees, uh, clients, um, the students most certainly, uh, your uh, service providers, um, council members, uh, people visiting the university and a whole host of, of other uh, subjects as well. So just be alert to the fact that when we say data subject, we're not just talking about the students. We're not just talking about employees. Uh, direct marketing, um, well, that's basically what, uh, what we perhaps thought it would be. Um, we all have received, and we are probably still receiving these annoying phone calls. We are receiving uh, spam emails. Uh, we are perhaps receiving it also by, via WhatsApp and SMSs, et cetera. So that's what direct marketing is. And, and you always ask yourself a question. When you get annoyed, you ask yourself, where did they get my information from? Somebody has been acting contra to the popular regulations. Is it the doctor that I visited? Is it um, the uh, furniture uh, shop where I bought my lounge suite from on credit? Who shared my information? Or was it simply uh, obtained by, um, by hackers who, who sort of gotten past the cybersecurity measures um, which the responsible party had in place. Um, I, I listened to an interesting uh, uh, conversation about a year ago on one of the local radio stations where it was mentioned by someone that private information are sold uh, on, on the dark net by way of bidding whole blocks of information. So if, if you are in the, uh, let's say in the tourism business and you want to, to target a specific uh, group of people with certain interests, then you can literally go out there and buy information, personal information of people that would fit your profile, the profile of the people that you are. Um, targeting. Um, anyway, uh, let's move on. The information officer, who is the head of the university currently, um, that would be our acting vice chancellor, Professor Lennington. Our operator, um, it might be somebody from outside who, who, who deals and operates with and process personal information. And it might also be somebody that, that's not even under the direct authority of the responsible party. Uh, so the responsible party in, in our discussion would be VUT. And ultimately, I spoke about a policy framework. Our policy framework and all our directives must, must mention the purpose and the means for processing personal information. We, we need to answer those questions. Why are we collecting the information? What do we need? What are we gonna do with it? Uh, may we amend it? May we share it with a third party, et cetera? So the personal information is what's driving this discussion. I'm going to read it so that it can sink in. It deals with race, gender, sex, pregnancy, uh, marital status, uh, interesting one, nationality, uh, ethnic or social origin education, uh, medical history. Okay, we can understand that one. Financial records, yes. Criminal or employment history. Any identifying number, uh, the question that, that was asked um, earlier on, one of the questions 
uh, but uh, I, I think Annika asked, you know, what, what about a, a physical uh, a, a picture? Yes, because it, it is anything that can identify a person. That's why it's so important, you know, with, with social media, we go about, we take photographs, we post it on Facebook, we, we uh, post it anywhere on, on Instagram and, and wherever. Strictly speaking, one will have to make sure that when you do it, that you are doing it with the consent, with the informed consent. And that's a big difference. It's a difference between consent and informed consent. When I give co informed consent, I know exactly what you're going to do with my information. So it wouldn't come as a surprise if you took a class photograph where I am an, attend an attendee of that class and now I see my photograph in the newspaper because you indicated to me as a lecturer that I'm going to post this in the newspaper. Um, personal opinions. This is an interesting one. The views or preferences of the person. Uh, any preference? Now you can you can ask the question, but why the preferences? I think I highlighted it with my example of earlier, where I said that there are people out there that would buy specific information for to target specific groups of people with the specific preferences, uh, correspondences, and and yeah, colleagues, we have to be very careful. We must be very careful where we when we forward emails that we received from, from colleagues. Uh, I'm not saying that you're not allowed to forward an email that let's say I sent to you or you sent to me or whatever, but if it is of a personal nature or a, a private or confidential nature, be careful. At least ask yourself, listen, will it be all right if I share this information? with a third party who was not part of this discussion. And now I'm revealing something that, um, that was maybe told to me in, in private. Um, uh, well, just, just think about it. The views or opinions of another individual about the person. When I express my views on, on a fellow colleague, which I should not be doing, that forms part of personal information. And I don't think that many of us knew that. The name of a person, the name of a person, personal information, if it appears with other personal information relating to the person, or if a disclosure of a name itself would reveal information about the person. Can't think of a good example right now, but um, if, if a name is disclosed, within a certain context, um, certain uh, deductions can be made, uh, which can then lead to the revelation of other information, which were not supposed to have been uh, disclosed. Um, see if you can come up maybe with a good example that I can use in future. So, all right, we understand there's this act and it's got all these chapters and it's got all these conditions and we're all in trouble. No, we're not. We must just be cautious. But who are we? And who are we have to be cautious about? So who is who in this? Oh, I don't want to say zoo, but who is who in, in, in this uh, whole situation? The information officer is uh, the main role player. Uh, as I mentioned earlier on, uh, our acting vice chancellor has been appointed with a regulator to be the information officer. And uh, just a quick look, I'm not gonna bore you with all of that. Uh, I, I want to jump to the compliance framework, which I mentioned to earlier on. And I want to quickly talk about the PAHIA manual. So the PAHIA manual, what on earth is this alphabet soup about? This is now the twin or the stepsister of POPIA. Promotion of access 
to Information Act. Promotion to access. Uh, compare that quickly with protection of personal information. So Papia talks about protection. Pahia talks about promotion of access. Now, without going into a detailed discussion about this, you can imagine that these two acts will compete against each other because in terms of a protection of a personal information act, which is um, basically protection of your personal right uh, in terms of section 14 of uh, the Bill of Rights in our constitution uh, to privacy. Um, this PAIA requires again also that uh, uh, emphasis is then put on another constitutional right and this constitutional right is a right to access of information. So uh, VUT has a PAIA manual um, it was uh, placed on ecom the other day for for comments so um, if you after the meeting quickly want to go back to the ecoms uh, i think it was uh, posted on the 14th or the 15th of october go and have a look at that because where PAIA protects information PAIA then says exactly under what conditions what information and who can uh, access that information or request that information. Um, we, we spoke about one of the conditions which are contained in uh, Chapter 3 of uh, the PAPIA Act of openness and um, the, the data subject to also be allowed access to the information. But obviously it needs to be done in a controlled, regulated way. PAPIA talks about that. And our PAHIA manual had to be adapted or amended to bring it in line with PAPIA as well. So one could argue that you're sitting here with two sides of the same coin. Uh, on the one hand, you're dealing with protection. On the other hand, you're dealing with access. And when you're giving access, how easy is it not to uh, maybe infringe on the protection side? And um, let me give you a practical example. Uh, you have a staff meeting. The staff meeting is con conducted on uh, via Teams and um, it, it is recorded like this uh, conversation we're having is recorded. And now you want as a member of the staff and who attended that meeting, um, you want a copy of that, uh, of, of that recording. Do you have access? Um, should you be given that access? Uh, who's actually going to decide and, and what criteria will be used? What if during that meeting, um, uh, certain personal information were disclosed, which were, um, which were limited to that discussion and limited to the group of people that were present, uh, can it now be shared with a third party without the, info, uh, without the approval um, of uh, the person whose information was shared? So uh, I'm not, I'm not uh, giving an answer to, to, to my own question here. I, I just want to spark that discussion where, where we can start talking about this. So then um, the VC is also responsible for the internal awareness sessions like this one. We uh, are busy with at the moment. So that's your, your one of the major role players. And then obviously the deputy information officers um, in, in, uh, on our campus, we have two. Uh, the first one is Dr. Dan McQuenna, who's our registrar. And the, the second one is Mr. Smangaliso. Uh, Velakazi, he is the um, Executive Director of Governance and uh, Legal Services. So um, how were these people elected? I don't know if they will agree with me uh, when I say they are people with sufficient time, resources and financial means to conduct their duties in terms of being a Deputy Information Officer because 
They might argue and say, ah, we don't have sufficient time for it, but that's the requirement set by the POPIA. Adequate skills and data privacy, information security, records management, and an intimate knowledge of how personal information are currently processed. So very important role players in respect of a POPIA. And, and those will be the people that will also ask questions about, you know, progress. Uh, how far are we with this implementation? Do we have a POPIA policy yet? Well, I hope they don't ask that question because if they do, then we know that that intimate knowledge would be lacking. So we talk about a policy framework. Uncle Sam wants your data. And, and we already indicated, I indicated to you for what purposes. There are more reasons than what I've, what I've uh, shared with you. But um, you, you are probably aware of, and maybe you have been a victim of, of certain scams where your personal information were, were breached. And to your detriment, maybe your bank account was... Uh, cleaned out or, um, uh, uh, you know, <clears throat> or you found, you found that um, you are now married to somebody else. That also happened. Uh, just a moment, please excuse me. So who plays the most important role here? Who is the most important role player? And, and I would say it's you. It's you and me. Wherever you are, whatever your job is, you and I must consider the requirements of, of the peer. So have a look at your, <clears throat> your job description, what you do on a daily basis. And whenever you deal with <clears throat> a question pertaining to data or personal information, be very careful. Um, I, I don't think my colleague will blame me if I use this example as a, uh, this incident as an example. I will not identify the colleague, so I de-identify the, the circumstances so that you won't be able to identify the person that I'm referring to. But this particular person got a request via email from a parent of an enrolled student or a past student, I can't remember of VUT requesting a copy of the academic record or um, results of that particular student because the parents are concerned they don't get it from the student. Now, do you oblige? Now, before you do, you have to consider the POPIA. You must ask yourself, would that fall sharing of this requested information, would that fall within the scope of personal information? Yes, tick. It, it would, most certainly. Uh, so can I simply just share it with the parents? In other words, do the parents have a right? Are they justified in obtaining that information? No, they're not because that information belongs to the data subject. Uh, now we can look at the PAHIA manual and say, all right, parent uh, X, you want the information, you can apply to the registrar's office for this information and the registrar's office will make a decision. But without the implicit uh, um, what is the word I'm looking for now, permission by that student, you will in all probability not be able to share that information with um, the parents. So the other role player is the data subject and, and it's, it's that person. And, and yeah, we, we wear different caps, uh, colleagues. Sometimes we are the data subject. Sometimes uh, we are employees of a responsible party. Uh, sorry, was that a question, uh, Naledi? 
No. Um, so sometimes we are the, the data subjects and sometimes we are employees of the responsible parties. Uh, so the data subject, our information as employees must be protected by the responsible party, by the UT. If there is a breach, we need to be notified of that breach immediately. Uh, if uh, students' information was, uh, were compromised, they need to be notified of that. As a data subject, students and we, as employees, we have a right to request access. I spoke about the PAHIA manual. We can, um, where we find that the information is outdated or um, that it's untrue or incorrect, we can then request um, correction of that information. So here's an interesting one. I, I get this question quite often. The data subject has a right to object to the personal information from being used. Now, let's say the data subject wants to enroll at VUT, but um, refuses to complete the application form in full. And specifically pertaining to, let's say, um, a question about gender or physical address, uh, because that's personal information and the, uh, the person decided that he or she doesn't want to share that information. Can they object? Short answer, yes, they can. However, they need to understand that if that information is crucially needed for the purpose of registration, then the registration process might be, uh, might be hampered and you might end up not being considered um, for registration. Um, there's many examples. Uh, you can apply for a bursary, you can apply for um, a visa uh, and, and decide not to disclose. Yes, that's within your right, um, but also just keep in mind that in all probability, um, your application will not be considered. The data subjects, and this is where we have to, um, to be very sure that we toe the line as far as the regulations are concerned and uh, the requirements of a POPIA. Complaints can be laid directly with the regulator. So a little bit more about the regulator later on. And then also the court can be approached uh, as it is. The next one is about the information regulator. So the, the, the next role player is the information regulator. Look at the information regulator in the same sense as you would view an ombudsman or uh, uh, an, uh, a body that can make certain decisions and respond to certain complaints and queries. The information regulator has a vast host of um, uh, duties and responsibilities. Uh, I, I'm just going to look at the handling of complaints. Obviously, they like a if I can use the word a watchdog to make sure that um, the uh, policy or not the policy, the, the act, uh, the, the act is implemented uh, properly. Um, they also have to monitor and enforce compliance. So compliance um, notices can be served. Um, the information regulator typically can, if there's a complaint, let's say against the institution, they can then uh, conduct an investigation to investigate the, the truthfulness of a complaint. Um, and then if it's found that the complaint, um, uh, you know, is, is valid, um, the enforcement or a um, certificate can be, can be issued where uh, compliance will then have to be done within a certain period of time. The information regulator is uh, an organization that one can also uh, ask for assistance. And, and, I, and, I, and I don't think we should refrain from doing that. Rather ask if you're not sure, if there's a question about whether 
I'm allowed to share certain information. Um, whether trans-border um, sharing of information is allowed in certain circumstances. Rather get a director, a directive from the information regulator before just simply doing it and hoping for the best. So um, at, on this point, um, I'm going to allow then for an, another set of questions. Uh, Naledi, if you may. We have two questions. The first question is from Renee van Eck. The question goes as follows. If in the case that we request, we, we got a request to give through the name, email, and telephone number of a student of one student from each class who are willing to be on a student committee, am I allowed to look up a student's telephone number on ITS and give it through to a next colleague without the student giving permission? And also since the telephone number is on ITS and all employees have access to it, can I do that? Yeah, that, that is a valid question. Uh, and, and I think it will be answered also when we take a look at the privacy notices, which are our uh, next point of discussion. I'm going to answer it in a typical lawyer's fashion by going the long route here. When we deal with PAPIA, we, 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 we must be careful not to, to cry. Uh, sorry, Renee, I'm not saying that you're doing this. Uh, on the contrary, it's a, it's a brilliant question. But we must, be, we must be careful not to cry wolf and say, Ah, oh, you know, with, with Papia, now we're not going to be able to do this. And how do they expect us to, to uh, do our job if we can't share information, et cetera, et cetera? What we have to do instead is to look at the request and consider it carefully. And if we're not sure, to ask the right person. Um, I've uh, introduced you to the, the, the main role players on campus, uh, who are the uh, information officer, the deputy information officer, etc. However, the short answer is, you will be able to share that information because one of them, there's a privacy notice that was published to the students on the website. I don't know if it's still there, I must actually check because it was on our old website, I know it was there, where the student are informed of exactly, in, in the greatest of detail, what information the university will collect from them, uh, what they will do with that information, who they are going to share that information uh, with. And, and, and one, of the, um, one of the conditions is that, um, uh, condition is not the right word, it will come to me now, but, but one of the exceptions perhaps is where the information can be shared with a fellow colleague of a university to advance the, on the reason why it was collected in the first instance. The information was collected in the first instance to uh, register the student and to ensure that the student can enjoy a student life with all the academic advantages that duty can, can offer. So if that information is then needed for another purpose related to the initial purpose, we in all probability will be able to argue and say, no, it's related. However, this is now a, a bizarre and ab absurd uh, example. Renee, if we would share that information with a, a service provider that wants the information so that they can do direct marketing, uh, conduct direct marketing. That would be totally different because it's not related to the initial, initial reason why that information was shared in the first place or collected in the first place. Um, now, Lady, the second question. It's a follow-up question to um, Renee's question. Anika would like to find out what form does the permission have to be 
in reference to Renee's example, can it be an informal message or does it have to be within a specific criteria? Well, uh, again, from, from a legal perspective, uh, we, we always say, cover yourself with paper. So, so if, if it was me, I, I, would, I would not simply rely on the privacy notice, which I uh, mentioned earlier on. Um, I would also, before I share that information, send an email to the, the students, perhaps, and uh, the affected students only, or the relevant students, explaining to them that this was a request, that's the information that, that is needed, and for them to reply with their consent. And that would be, in all probability, be a, 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 an example of informed consent, because I'm telling that student exactly what information I have, uh, what information was uh, uh, requested from me and who requested it and for what purpose. And if a student then answers back and, say, and says, um, it's fine, you can share that information, then it means the information can be shared for that specific purpose and that specific information only can, can be shared. Uh, I, I had um, interaction with, with some of the, the colleagues as well where information of students um, will be shared with third parties. And um, what I proposed them to do is to um, pe perhaps draft a, a, a sort of a, a disclaimer, uh, a very basic one where the student, in the student's words, would say, uh, I, uh, so-and-so, um, with student number such and such, uh, agrees that my information pertaining to my name, ID number, telephone number, and physical address uh, may be shared by my lecturer with the um, house committee. Uh, I'm just giving a simple example, or a stupid example of the, uh, this particular residence for the purpose of creating a, a list to um, invite people to a function, you know, something to, like that. So, so what I'm trying to say is when, when you go that route, you want to be as specific as possible. And, and uh, uh, colleagues, remember, you, you try to get it right the first time. I mean, we all like that. But also rest assured, if not all of us are legal person, uh, legal people, we, we, we might make a mistake, but that's fine. As long as we follow the, the basic guidelines and, and we attempt to, um, to show that there was informed consent. I, I don't think you will be blamed for that. You, you might be told to do it differently next time, but um, that to me would, would really protect you um, in, from, from that uh, perspective. Um, Naledi, anything else? The next question is from R Ricardo. The question reads as follows. Regarding the example you just gave about the parent requesting an academic record, what if the parent or any other entity such as a company has a vested interest in the results, i.e. they're paying for the student's qualification? That per se does not uh, entitle them to the information. Uh, the information will still have to be cleared or the sharing of that information will still have to be cleared by the, the data subject. So um, I, I would simply respond. Uh, just to go back, we, we said earlier on that uh, the, the data subject, the data subject can, can object to personal information from being used. And, and I mentioned very briefly that if you apply for a, for a bursary, that you, you might then say, no, I'm not gonna uh, share certain information with the uh, bursa, and that could eventually jeopardize your, your bursary. Now, the same example or the, the, the same principle applies here. 
as a, an employee of a responsible party, I would not share that information with the um, with a bursa without having the informed consent of the student. So it, it would typically be, and, and it needn't even be that complicated. And Ricardo, probably I, I will, if I get that email, I would then um, send an email of my own to that student and say, so-and-so from this company um, requested the following information from me and I need your permission uh, to share this information. And again, the student can come back and say, under no circumstances are you going to share my results. Then you can respond to the requester and say, well, that's the case. Then it becomes an issue between the student and and the, um, uh, the, the, the business or the uh, provider of the funds. The same with the parents. So, but at least what, what would happen? You as an employee of VUT would be protected under that circumstances because you will be able to show that you have seeked um, informed consent and you were then either given permission by email, which would be your proof, or you were denied a permission, which you will also then be able uh, to prove. So it needn't be a difficult uh, decision to make. At, at, at the end of the day, if we follow the golden rule, look, there are exceptions um, where information may be shared without the informed consent, but I'm just asking myself, do I really want to take that chance? Uh, let me err on the side of safety and make sure that in each and every uh, instance, I get the informed consent of the data subject that way. And, and, and maybe it's, it's overcautious, but, but that way I'm sure that you will be protecting your own um, interest at the end of the day and that of the university by being overcautious. Uh, anything else, uh, my lady? The final question is from Mantombi. The question says, if my HOD is asking me to share the marks with him or her of a particular student, do I continue to send the marks or do I refuse? Yeah, your, your HOD has a mandate to have access to that information. Your HOD also in all probability will be able to access ITS or to request access to ITS to get that information. Um, it, it takes us back to the discussion on the privacy notices where uh, it is explicitly mentioned that personal information which includes the marks or the results of the students will also be shared with other members of staff inside the VUT uh, community for the same purposes to enhance and to, uh, to manage this academic, um, this academic uh, experience of, of that student. So, so you will in all probability be able to, um, to, to use the privacy notice and the fact, and, and, and remember, Montombi, the reason why that information was captured in the first place is to manage the whole process, this academic process, uh, which the, the student is, is undergoing. And, and part of it is the administration of marks. And there's also quality control and, and et cetera, et cetera. So it's all related. It's not as if you are simply sharing that information with somebody that doesn't have, like Ricardo mentioned earlier on, an, uh, a, a vested interest. Um, your, it is directly related. It is not separated in the sense that the same request by um, Sassel or uh, um, Sanlam or one of those uh, verses would, would be because this person that's asking for the information is an employee of a responsible party who um, 
who has to have access in order to carry out her duties in terms of, of, of um, ensuring that the academic site is managed for the best uh, result for the student at the end of the day. Um, if there's nothing else, uh, Naledi, then uh, I think I can move on. Yes, so that was all the questions for now. All right, uh, colleagues. Well, the good news is we're getting into the final stretch and uh, um, you are almost released. And uh, <clears throat> then you can go back and consider what we've discussed today. So um, we basically already discussed the privacy notices. So that's in terms of uh, section 18, which you will find in uh, chapter three of the Papia. Uh, remember, that's one of the chapters that um, you will have to go and have a good look at to see what, what it really entails. Um, I can just tell you that for the privacy notices, a privacy notice for a student will and does differ from a privacy notice which you will um, hand to a, an employee of uh, VUT for argument's sake, it will be different from the privacy notice which you um, uh, would post for a service provider or a visitor. Because the reason for which you collect that information um, in each case would be different. So that's what the um, privacy notice will be driven by the purpose of that um, information, the personal information. So there it says um, the, in, the data subject needs to be informed. The data subject needs to be told exactly what information is going to be used, uh, for what purpose, uh, with whom it's going to be shared. It's going to be shared with um, the HOD, perhaps, or it's going to be shared with... Um, uh, um, uh, maybe the people from the judiciary department at VUT who wants to charge that student for misconduct. Imagine that. So will you be able to share it? Yes, because it forms part of the academic process, of the, the management of that academic process. So the rights of a data subject are also explained um, when, when I talk about a privacy notice, this document runs into a couple of pages because it's such a detailed document. Um, it even explains to the student and to the staff what VUT will do in the case where information would leak. Uh, what, what, what would VUT's duties be? Well, one of the duties is we have to inform that data subject immediately of such a breach. And then we must try and mitigate whatever uh, uh, consequences or negative consequences there could be as a result thereof. Um, we, we need to tell the data subject about the cybersecurity that, that's being used to protect their data, where and how the data will be stored, when and for how long, how the data will be destroyed at the end of the day. Looking at the privacy notice, looking at section 18, when you read that, if you really only want to read one section of the Popia, I would suggest that's the one. Because when you read that section, you really get a feel for what the legislator really wanted to um, achieve by uh, by promulgating the um, Popia Act. So that's why it needs to be very, very detailed. Right, let's just catch our breath here for a moment. So we know there is an act, the, the Poppy or the Popia. We know that there are a number of requirements that has to be met by any um, responsible party, VUT, um, 
et cetera, et cetera. We know that there's a data subject with a number of rights. We also know that um, for, for each of the uh, reasons that we forward to collect information, that there are certain criteria that needs to be, to be met. And we also know that this whole process is regulated. In other words, if we don't meet those criteria, if we don't adhere to them, then we might land ourselves into um, to difficulty. So, and eventually we also know what who the role players are, but most importantly, we know that we as VUT employees also play a major role in terms of the popular. So <clears throat> we need as a collective to look at the way we deal with information at VUT in a different way. We need to be a culture change. We need to, to look at how we, we need to reconsider how we deal with information. Uh, wonderful practical examples already came out uh, through your questions. And so it has already sparked what, um, what I wanted to achieve with this discussion, and, and that is to open up the communication. So <clears throat> how do we go about changing the culture at, at, at VUT. Now, as I said in the beginning, <coughs> I'm not talking about changing the culture in a, <coughs> in, a, in a broad sense, specifically with regards to how we deal with personal information. Uh, firstly, by establishing the, the, the context, we, we, we need to look at our own situation where we are, where we are dealing with the personal information of others, of uh, our employer and, and, and all the data subjects and, and ask us, you know, what should we do where we are, where I am in, in order to, to control the, um, and, and, and to manage the information that, that I deal with. And uh, what, what is required internally and also externally for the university to achieve its goals. And, and then we will be able to, in that context, uh, you see, Ricardo, that's where, if you created that context, you will then be in a position to say, <clears throat> all right, uh, the university as a academic institution deal with students and get the information in. So if a third party then contacts us, do they really have that mandate for to um, demand that I share that information with them? What is the context? And the context would also include the context in which the information was gathered in the first place. And then you might get to a point where you say no. It is different from Antombi's example, where she said, uh, you know, can I share with my, with my HOD? Because the context might be different. Just a thought. So to do riskier identification, uh, we, most of us are, uh, are uh, aware of a SWOT analysis. Uh, anybody in South Africa that did any sort of uh, tertiary qualification somewhere along the line did the SWOT analysis. Believe me, there's more tools that can be used, but um, just to identify the risk and specifically with regards to, to Popia. Evaluating those risks by looking at uh, the predetermined criteria so that we can identify and, and, and ladies and gentlemen, uh, colleagues, we have a whole unit at our university that's devoted to this uh, risk evaluation. 
So if there's any of those colleagues uh, in attendance this morning, um, let's have a chat and, and see how we can um, evaluate this risk as well and see how we're gonna treat it. Risk treatment. So once you've, you've identified, um, you've analyzed the risk, you've evaluated the risk, you need to do something about this risk. Well, obviously, those of you that are in risk management can, can vouch for me when I say, one of the ways to, to deal with a risk is to do nothing, just leave it. Now, I'm not canvassing for that. I'm not saying that uh, once you've identified the risk, you simply just leave it. Um, make sure that you deal with it in the most effective way. And then once you've dealt with it, to monitor and to review. Yes, I acknowledge the fact, some of you are gonna say to me, but France, listen, um, what you're saying here is more on a macro or meso uh, management level. And uh, you know, poor me, um, where I function in this whole organogram, it's got nothing to do with me. It's got everything to do with you. Because at the end, you are the one that may deal with that specific uh, uh, personal information. You will have to make that decision. And if you're not aware of the possible risks in your own environment, in your own situation, then you might have um, a big problem. Uh, I might have a big problem trying to assist you to get out of that uh, problematic uh, business because um, we, we run rough shot over the, the papaya requirements. So, but culture will only change if we decide that each and every one of us plays a, and has a major role to play in changing that, that culture. Um, I'm not gonna say much about this, when and how to conduct a personal information impact assessment. Um, all I'm going to say is, whenever you are confronted with a decision or the question to share or not to share information, internally, externally, third party, um, ask yourself a few questions. When, when I say a personal information impact assessment, it needn't be a long-winded, drawn-out affair. Um, if, you, if you Google the, the Yukisa uh, uh, website, it, it's freely available. There, there, there are toolkits that you can download. Uh, there's examples. For instance, using a new, wanting to use a new um, computer system, uh, software. What sort of questions do you ask yourself pertaining specifically to uh, the POPIA? Now, if you want to go through to that extent to determine the performance of uh, personal information impact assessment, uh, it's fine. Then you do that uh, depending on where you function, depending on how it is applicable to you. In your, uh, if you're a researcher, Professor Dix, then you would ask yourself when I'm dealing with, um, uh, I'm included in a research project with children, what are uh, the information impact that it could have, the personal information impact? Let's do an assessment. Uh, exactly how is this information going to be, um, uh, to be gathered? Um, are we going to send out questionnaires? Who are going very much in the same fashion that you've dealt with this in your ethics uh, applications. But there are other examples, and, and, and I think we, we need to just go and have a look at how it is done perhaps uh, in, in other universities and, and also perhaps in other countries. So uh, let's say if there's any colleagues from the to the uh, pro procurement department. If there's a new service provider or supplier, uh, how are you gonna deal with that? Uh, you, 
there's, there's, a, there's a risk, there's a possible risk that your personal information or that company's personal information might be jeopardized. So do an impact. And when I say impact, it needn't be something broad. It, it needn't be a big issue. Just ask sensible questions. So here we are. We have finally arrived. The train is now pulling into the station. You, you can now ask the question, which is a valid question. Okay, so what? You told us about all of this. Uh, you, maybe I sounded like the boogeyman. Well, I'm, 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 I, I am warning you against this thing, Poppia. No, that's not what I'm doing. We, we need to be informed of what the challenges are. We need to um, look at the culture at VUT, the culture of dealing with personal information. And uh, we have to change that culture. We know how to do it. We must start asking the right questions and, and uh, start debating about this. Uh, not for the purpose to be right, and to be the prophet of doom, but to eventually, as 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 a as as a community, as a as a staff, to get to a place where we feel comfortable in how we deal with the personal information, where we show the necessary uh, respect and and sometimes restrain before we share information. So. At the station, here yeah, where we are now parked, the vital question is, what is the way forward? What, what are we to take away from this all today? Well, obviously, each one of us has their own thought processes and, and their own way of uh, evaluating things. So each one will take something perhaps different. But, but if I can guide you, if I can be forward enough to guide you, I would say to you, after this discussion of this morning, take some time out. Just, just stop. Make yourself a cup of coffee. Uh, and, and just ponder what you have learned today. Jot it down, perhaps, and ask yourself, okay, so, so what, what does it mean to me in my particular job uh, what, what, what do I have to consider, you know? Uh, what are the challenges? And then once you've identified that, just start somewhere, even if it's a little thing, uh, just to say, all right, in future, whenever I get an email that seems like it's requesting personal information, I will reply as follows, and that will be my standard reply. That is a start. And the, the third point, uh, one, one, of the, one of my favorite uh, people in history is uh, um, Winston Churchill. And he, he was quite a, a strange character. And at one stage, uh, his um, cabinet ministers asked him, the, the war effort is, is not going that well. And what must we do now? And his simple answer was, keep buggering on. <laughs> now, to keep buggering on in this instance is, it might be a daunting task to become popular compliant. And when I say keep buggering on, don't keep buggering on in the same way that you've done in the past. You must go forward and Start changing the culture and keep on going forward. And in that light, I want to challenge you. I want to challenge you by asking. I know I said initially, read at least the first three chapters. All right. But um, you, can, you can go back to that if you really want to. But I would like you to really, even if you just scan the act very quickly, just go and read through it again. Uh, again, or for the first time, uh, identify the aspects that you that you see there, especially in chapter three, 
that are of direct interest to you personally, as, as, a, as, a, as a personal subject, or in your job or your family or your family life, your business environment, uh, wherever. Identify those aspects and <clears throat> see how you're going to deal with it. Ponder it a little bit. Ask yourself, so what? What can I do about it? Uh, uh, download one of uh, Yukisa's personal information impact assessment toolkits. Uh, adapt that toolkit perhaps to your own situation. Uh, identify just one risk and, and do that assessment and, and draft your own risk plan. See how it goes. Draft it, show it to somebody in your department, uh, show it to your husband, to your wife, um, and, and uh, then implement it. See if, if it works. Even a bad plan is better than nothing. When I say keep buggering on, I'm not saying keep buggering on as you did in the past. Try something new, put your head down, and, and go, go for it. Discuss it with colleagues, uh, discuss it with line supervisors, uh, ask the questions at meetings. That's at your, your faculty meetings, at your um, management uh, meetings. Um, wherever there's an audience, open the discussion about Popia. Collaboration. Uh, where we, as, as colleagues, can take each other's hands and say, right, this poppy thing is our, our collective challenge. Let's take it, take it forward. Are there other options? If you don't want to take the, the challenge, yes, of course. You, and, and many of you can do your own research. You can develop your own strategies. I'm not saying that that my way is the best way or the only way, no, nothing. Or you can do your own research, you, you can develop your own strategies, your, and, or you can do nothing. Now, even if you do nothing, you're doing something because then you have chosen not to face up to the challenge. You have chosen not to be part of uh, the culture change. Um, and, and that, that is a serious decision, and, and it could end up um, having certain repercussions. So I would advise strongly against that of doing nothing, rather keep buggering on. So, okay, um, is it all talk and no show from the legal services department? No, it's not. Uh, from the legal services department, and uh, I, I see Kim Matloko is also locked in. Um, I'm talking on your behalf as well, Kim. So we, we are committed to assist where we can as a legal services department. You can send whatever questions you have pertaining to the POPIA to me directly or to Kim. And um, we will, once we received it, we will um, then respond to your requests. Um, if you have a request, um, I, I don't know, I haven't asked uh, um, Naledi about this, but um, if, if Naledi can share the personal information in respect of the email addresses of the attendees today, then I can send you an electronic copy of a POPIA, then you have a copy which you can consult, and um, I can also send you a copy of, uh, actually, it's a draft copy of a code of conduct drafted by Yusuf uh, University of South Africa Forum, um, which is a document that all the universities basically agreed upon to use as a sort of a, uh, a code of conduct with regards to the POPIA. Um, there will be follow-up webinars. Uh, look out for them. Um, this one, the general introduction one, will be repeated. You don't have to obviously attend those, but there will be follow-up ones. Uh, perhaps uh, the next one will be specifically 
on research related questions, but if there's anything else or any other uh, uh, recommendations, then I will gladly have a look at that as well. So send us your requests and we will gladly um, uh, look at it and, and assist as a, as a team. So simply, when we look at a challenge, we can say a lot about challenges. We can say challenges are there to make us stronger. We can say challenges are there to test our strength, our metal. What I want to propose today is a simple, a simple thing, just to simply say, I am accepting the challenge. And, and that's all, accepting the challenge. And then from there, one can follow those basic proposals uh, and, and take it from there. Uh, do you now know all that needs to be known about Popia? Goodness, no. I, mean, I don't know everything about the Popia either. But it's a learning process. Every time we said it in the beginning, a discussion, every discussion, we will implement it by one discussion at a time. Uh, thank you. Thank you very much for your time and for your patience and specifically for your time, colleagues. I know how busy we all are. So um, uh, I really do appreciate both of you that came out today. Uh, thank you. And then, uh, my lady, I'll open it up. Uh, you can open it up for the last um, uh, questions, then, please. The last questions, Mr. Fushia, were actually the first one was requesting the, the Papia document. So I think everybody's uh, quite keen on getting the, electro the electronic copies that you have mentioned. I will share the email addresses of all the attendees so that you can... With the consent, of course. With the consent, ladies and gentlemen, if there's anybody that, that's opposed to share your email address with me, uh, you can just indicate that to my lady, please. Yeah. Of course, yes, of course. <laughs> and then um, Mantumbi was actually was asking if you could please have if you could please share your email address for any concern, any, any concerns I, or requests that they should have. I, I am, I will gladly do that. Uh, it is Daniel F, uh, F for Foshia. So it's Daniel F and then the normal at VUT. Daniel F. And I'm willingly sharing this uh, email address with everybody at the age of 54 being male. <laughs> Thank you very much, Mr. Fushia. This was a very informative um, session. And I think we can all agree that we have learned a lot that we, we were not aware of and we were aware of, but a, a bit confused as to how it applies to our daily lives, especially in, in our careers. So I'm very, very, very um, grateful for this session. And I would like to thank all the colleagues who attended um, the session. And I would like to wish you all a good day. Thank you. Thank you also for your role that you played in coordinating behind the scenes. Now, lady, looking forward to work with you soon. And uh, goodbye to everybody. Be safe and uh, COVID is still around. Thank you, have a good day. Thank you, bye-bye.